This keynote is Demystifying Machine Learning. That's the title. Uh, I'm going to go, start with uh, explaining what machine learning is, then I'm going to go over a few use cases. I'm going to talk about the um, limitations that, uh, that are inherent to these techniques. Then I'll explain briefly what predictive APIs are and what, what's changing, uh, what, what they are changing to the game. And we see, uh, we, we see if these techniques work, how can we measure that they work. Um, I've got a case study. Hopefully, we have time to go over that. And finally, a few words about this machine learning canvas. That's going to be very quick, but uh, maybe that, that would get you interested in uh, finding out more. So before I start, I've got a couple of quotes from you know, very important people about the uh, importance of predictive apps, just to get you warmed up and excited about the, uh, the, the, the conference and the, the content. So yeah, predictive apps. Uh, there's this analyst who says that it's the next big thing in uh, app development. We've got this, uh, I think he's the chief data scientist at, the, at Visa, the credit card company. He talks of uh, you know, what it is to big data. And apparently, it's, uh, it's a big deal. And yeah, so I've talked of predictive apps. The thing is that the, to, to create predictive apps, you need two things. You need machine learning, and you need to learn from data. So that's sort of the relationship between uh, these predictive apps and this uh, machine learning that we've, we've mentioned earlier. So yeah, we need to have machine learning techniques, and we need to have data, and then uh, we can build predictive apps. But there's a big but which is uh, this. Um, so that's from the, the McKinsey study in 2011, where they, they essentially, they, there's a number of things that you can find in the study. But what's interesting here is that they predicted a shortage of talent that would make it difficult to exploit the value of that data with machine learning. So essentially, they're saying that there's a, there's a shortage of talent. So how are we going to you know, find the people who have the machine learning expertise? and uh, apply that on data. Uh, but actually, as we see today, machine learning is being democratized. So that was in 2011. Now we're in 2015, and uh, things are a little bit different. For those of you who follow me on Twitter, uh, you might have seen that tweet where I said, you know, I just updated my slides for my keynote, and uh, you know, it's going to be very nice. That's the only slide that I did not update. Uh, obviously, it's, from, uh, it's two years old now. It's an email I got in 2013, which is um, obviously it's spam, right? It's a, it's a spam email. And today, we don't really think about it, but we've got spam detectors that just remove that from our inbox. And that uses machine learning. So we've been using, we've all been using machine learning for some time now. And specifically, what, what this does is that it <clears throat> the, the spam filter answers a question which is, you know, it, get, it gets a new email that's never seen before. And before you even see it, it's going to be able to predict whether or not you're going to be interested in that. So there's a question about this email, which is, you know, which type of email is this? And then two possible answers, spam or ham. So we say that this is a classification problem because we're asking a question and there's only a fixed uh, set of possible answers, which are called classes. So all the which type of questions, that's classification. And so yeah, just a few terminology. Um, this, so the email, is what we call the input. And the, the class that we, um, that we label this input with is called the output. Right? So we've, we're given an input, and we have to you know, predict this output. The way that machine learning works is that you've got some data. So that's on the left side. We've got a cloud of uh, you know, input, outputs, and pairs. And based on these examples of you know, inputs and associated outputs that have been observed, we can learn something that we call a model that sort of explains the relationships between these things. Uh, and the, the cool thing about that model is that when we use it on a new input that we've never seen before, we're able to create a prediction for what the output should be. So there's two main phases, which are train and predict. Right? 
Of course, there's the question of how do you get that model, uh, but yeah, I'll talk about that later. Let's take another example, which is um, in real estate. Let's say that you're selling your house and you're trying to figure out the best price um, for, for what you're selling. So you've got, you know, you can represent your, your property with a set of characteristics, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, surface, the year it was built in, and you know, that's sort of your input and what you're trying to predict is how much is it worth? So how much is this house worth? The answer is uh, X, it's a number. Um, so yeah, it's the, when the answer is a number, we talk of a regression task. And here is some sample data for this, uh, for this use case, where I've put, like you can see, um, bedrooms, bathrooms, surface here built, and type of property. And then there's the price. So it's kind of like you know, an Excel table where um, there are some uh, missing values in the, in the price column. So the price is the output that we, we're trying to predict, and the rest is the input. And essentially, yeah. I've highlighted it with the same colors as uh, the, the diagram before. Uh, what's in light yellow is the training data. So the data you use to, to create your model. Uh, it's the data for, um, it's all the, the rows where you have the value for the, the price column. And you use that to create your model and then you, you're going to apply the model to the blue guys in order to predict the associated output, the, the price, and you can fill in the missing values. So you can sort of see machine learning as a way to fill in missing values in um, a spreadsheet table. Again, data, model, use the model with the input, create a prediction. So yeah, two phases. Uh, the the two-phase thing is quite important. I'll refer to that again later. So what you can, you, you can sort of see things as you know, machine learning, it's artificial intelligence, it, you know, it makes predictions. But the intelligence works by referring to this example data. You know, it only works because there's data that we can refer to in order to make predictions. So in a sense, it's very similar to what we do as humans. If you would have to predict the prices of uh, you know, real estate, you would, get, you would go through ads, uh, you would look at past transactions, and you would build your own internal model of what the dynamics are. So you'd understand that you know, the surface is big, then the price is going to be quite high, uh, that certain areas are better than others. And that's just based on you know, looking at examples and you know, storing them in your mind and then referring implicitly or explicitly, uh, referring to them in order to make predictions. So very similar to what we would do uh, in this case. So let's go, go over a few use cases. So there's the real estate one, there's the spam one that I mentioned, still with emails and still with classification. There's um, priority inbox, so that's a feature of Google, but now others are using it, uh, Google Mail actually, uh, which is you know a new email comes in and you haven't looked at it, and it's going to predict whether the, the email is important or not. If it's important, you know, it's gonna go up in your inbox. And then there's uh, another use case that I find quite interesting, which is uh, crowd prediction. So predicting how many people are gonna turn up at, a, at you know, a certain location. And I think that I'm, I'm, I'm quite good myself with that because uh, I sort of, we, we ordered catering for 175 people and we are exactly 175. So yeah, that's crowd prediction in action. <laughs> All right, so real estate, input is the property. The output is the price. Spam, uh, the input is the email, the output is the spam indicator. Is it spam? Yes, uh, otherwise no. Priority inbox, same thing, except that the indicator is uh, related to the importance of the email. And crowd prediction, you have a location, you have a context, which is given by you know, the, the, the date, for instance. You know, is it a bank holiday? Is, it, is there uh, an, another event uh, at, a closer, at a close location? And then you're trying to, based on that, predict the number of people that are going to be at this location in this particular context. And these are used in, uh, in real life. So there's uh, this website, which is called Zillow in the US. I'm not sure that we're doing that in France yet, uh, but might be. Uh, there's Gmail for spam and for uh, priority inbox, and lots of other email clients, of course. 
And for uh, crowd prediction, there's this app which is called Tranquilien, uh, which is well, some of you might have used it if you live in Paris. And uh, we'll hear a little bit about that uh, later on with, uh, when I'll speak with uh, Ran Hindi from SNPs. So that's at uh, 2 p.m. All right, so I've listed now, I've listed a few use cases of you know, how machine learning is going to help you create value for your business, how you can use it in your business. And there's like three main areas uh, that I've listed, which are you know, getting more customers, serving your customers better, and then, uh, what was the last one? Serving them more efficiently. Uh, for getting more users, there's uh, obviously you can just like, you know, get new users, but you can also reduce the number of people who leave your company, who, who are not customers, uh, who stop being customers, sorry. So that's called reducing churn, reducing attrition. Uh, you, can, uh, you can try to get more customers, so you've got leads and you have to uh, qualify them, you have to make sure before you spend time, you know, getting, uh, you spend time and money getting new customers, you have to make sure that, you know, they, they, they're going to be interested in what you have to offer. And uh, the last thing is that, you know, when you're, uh, when you're contacting these leads, can you optimize the, the campaigns that, that you use for you know, getting those leads to uh, be interested in, uh, in your service? So inputs and outputs. The input for churn is a customer, and the output is a churn indicator. Uh, is this person uh, leaving the, is, is, he, is he canceling or she canceling the, uh, the subscription to the service uh, or not. Scoring leads, you want to sort of understand the, the relationship between the customer and the revenue that you, you get from that customer based on the attributes that characterize the customer. And uh, when you're optimizing a campaign, you, you, you have a customer and you have a candidate campaign and you want to see, you want to predict whether the customer is going to be interested in that campaign. So you can try different campaigns and then see what the interest indicator is and pick the right campaign for a given customer. And I think that uh, NPCs is going to speak about that in the showcase later. Uh, they're going to speak about uh, predictive email marketing, so probably we'll hear more about that. Then you've got the, so yeah, another way of using machine learning is to um, make it um, you know, to better serve customers. So you can cross-sell products, which is a way to you know, serve them better, because if they're interested in uh, other products, then you have to help them you know, find out about the, uh, uh, those products. You can increase the engagement of uh, you know, users of your app, for instance, or users of your service. And you can, uh, the last thing is that you can optimize the pricing so that more people are going to find your service affordable, or at least you know they they're going to find that the the, the value that it brings to uh, to them matches the the price. When you're cross-selling, you have a customer and a product that you can cross-sell, and you want to predict you know whether there's going to be a purchase or not. Uh, increase engagement. You have a user. You have an item that you want to present to that user. It can be a piece of content, for instance and you try to predict their, their interest for that before you, you present that content. And pricing, you've got a product, you've got a price, you want to predict how many sales you, you're going to get. So you, know, you might adjust the price and see how that affects the predictions, and then in the end you, you can sort of see what, what's going to be uh, most beneficial. And we'll have a talk on um, product recommendations uh, by Dave from uh, Resolve Digital, so you, you'll hear about that uh, this morning. And the last um, area is serving customers more efficiently. So one way to serve customers efficiently is to predict you know, what the demand for your service or for the products that you sell. Uh, you can also automate tasks that are being done you know, manually by humans and now uh, you know, have machine learning do them automatically. And the last thing is using predictive enterprise apps. So I'll tell you a little bit more in the, other, in the next slide. Predicting demand, you've got a context, uh, and you want to figure out you know, how many people are going to buy the, the product in, given that context. Um, so we'll hear about that with uh, Lars in the afternoon, Lars from Blue Yonder. Uh, automating tasks, so I've just given one example. There's loads of, exa of examples, but um, this one is for the, bank the banking industry. Someone is applying for a credit, so they fill in this application form. You, you get 
uh, information about what, who they are, what type of credit they want, and then you, you want to predict if they're going to repay that credit before you, before you say yeah. Uh, so you know, instead of doing that manually, you, know, you can have machine learning uh, make better decisions by looking at uh, lots of data. Predictive enterprise apps. So there's, uh, again, this idea of you know, filtering things by priority so that your workforce focuses on what's more, uh, what has the highest priority. There's uh, message routing, which is important, which is interesting for uh, customer relationship management. If someone sends a request and you want to efficiently uh, assign the best person to reply to that request, uh, if you can do that automatically, then you're saving lots of time. And there's uh, auto configuration where you know the the app sort of figures out what the user wants to do with it based on previous usage, and just shows what, what what's interesting to the user, and also sets the settings automatically so that it's uh, uh, it's more usable. So input for priority filtering, you get a message and priority indicator as an output. Um, message routing, you want to map the request to the employee who's going to be able to uh, reply to that request in the best way. And out of configurations, you've got a user and a set of actions that user has performed, and you want to predict what the best settings are. The thing that I have to mention about that is that you know, it's, it's, it's automatic, but you could also create a set of rules uh, where you know, you'd say when you get a message that has this keyword, you, know, you, you send it to that person. The thing about machine learning is that you don't need to program these rules. The rules are learned automatically from data. So you save, you save a lot of time because you, know, you don't have to do that manually. And also uh, because you know, if, if the dynamics change, if things change, you can retrain another model and you can adapt. So it's, uh, it's more adaptive. And there's this um, partner at a venture capitalist firm in the US who <clears throat> uh, predicts that you know, the having machine learning, having predictive apps is going to increase productivity and creativity. All right, so we've talked about the, the use cases, the, all the great possibilities of machine learning, but you know, it, it, there's no free lunch. I mean, there's, uh, there's got to be a couple of catches. So here I'm just, uh, so th let's say that we have a classification problem. Regarding the colors, it's not input and output anymore. Blue and orange just represent two different classes. And these points are inputs. And the, uh, the, the color corresponds to the class, so to the outputs that's associated to each point. Like you can imagine that you know, these are a set of measurements where you have one dimension for one me measurement and the other dimension for uh, the other measurements. And yeah, we know that the, the guys in blue are blue, they're from the blue class, and then the orange guys are from the orange class, and that's training data, so we've got inputs and outputs, and we want to build a model. Right? So in this particular instance, it's very easy. Uh, if you know, you, new data comes in, like these black guys, uh, we want to just assign a color to them. We want to say you know, the, the color is blue, so you know, you, you're in the blue class. And it's very straightforward in this case. I mean, the one on the left is blue, the one on the right is orange, obviously. And you can sort of explain things with uh, you know, just a line that separates the two classes. And if you're on one side of the line, then you're blue. On the other side, you're, you're orange. And this line actually is your model. That's the model that you use when new data comes in. The thing, though, is that yeah, if you want that to work, you need examples of inputs and outputs. So that was sort of a given, but it's not that easy. If we go back to the spam example, uh, you need to have examples of what the outputs were. So you need to have someone at some point who manually labeled emails as spam or non-spam. So in certain cases, you can just observe what people do, and you get, labeled, you get data with inputs and outputs very easily by just observing what, what people do, how they behave. In other cases, you might have to, you know, to spend time to have a human label uh, inputs with uh, the, the output values. So you have to think about that. You know, do I have the output? Do I have a way to get these uh, outputs to then learn my machine learning model? So what if you don't have enough data points, which might lead you to this? You know, you've got examples of blue guys and of orange guys, but then a new one comes in, and it's like you know, there's, there's uh, nothing close to this. So it's like, you know, what, what color should I give? 
And typically, you know, that's, uh, that, that's a problem where you didn't get enough data because there was a part of, uh, you know, the objects that exist in the real world that you didn't observe in your training data. And that's going to make it difficult to make a prediction. The other uh, case where it would be problematic to make predictions is uh, when similar inputs have dissimilar outputs, which would be illustrated with this. You know, that's just a mess, and there's no way I can use that to figure out, you know, if a new point comes in, if it should be blue or orange, it's just mixed up. Another way to see this problem is with, uh, so for a regression task, so that was classification. Let's go back to regression where we're trying to predict a number. So the price of the house. Imagine that we only have two attributes for each house, for each property, which are number of bedrooms and number of bathrooms. Clearly, that's not enough. I mean, uh, there's no way that I can just predict the price based on that. And that's what we can see in this data. So OK, it's fake data, but still, it illustrates this point that you've got houses that are uh, identical in the way that they are represented here, but the prices are completely different. So what do you have to do? You have to add more information. So you have to. Uh, you know, figure out what are the characteristics that are important to predict the price. So there's the surface, obviously, uh, you know, how old the, the house is, how old the property is. There's, uh, you could think of, you know, where the property is located. Is it close to the metro station? Or there's uh, a whole lot of things that you can think about. And uh, in the end, you know, you're training your model from your data. So if the data is, is bad, then the model is going to be bad too, right? And yeah, so a model can only be as good as the data it was given to train on. Uh, yeah, that's just me saying that. If you haven't got my Twitter handle, here it is again. Um, and we'll have two talks that will illustrate the importance of, um, of you know, working on that data. So there's Dataiku's showcase where they're going to show their product that makes it you know, easier to uh, improve the, the quality of your data. And then there's the talk of uh, Kieran from Datagami, uh, which is going to talk. So Kieran is going to talk about the importance of data and how, you know, for this particular use case of real estate, you know, adding, taking into account open data and creating new features uh, from that, it's uh, new representations of the inputs that can be very beneficial for the quality of the model. And one thing that I noticed about these two companies is that, you know, they, the names both start with uh, data data, and uh, they, they like birds, apparently. <laughs> so there's a pattern here. It's, uh, yeah, interesting. All right, predictive APIs. So the promise of predictive APIs is to make it easier for everyone to use machine learning. It's to democratize machine learning. All right, so here's an example of, that's a web page on my website, uh, which is for my book. And what I want to say here, so yeah, take a look. Doesn't look that bad. And actually, what you need to create a page like this usually is to program something in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, like the you know the thing, the, the the banner at the top. You can close that. So that's JavaScript. The layout, that's CSS, and the HTML is the, the actual content. But I didn't do any of that for that website. I actually used a service which is called Squarespace.com. And I just had to you know, move things around. It was, uh, there, there was a graphical interface where I could just you know, pick the layout I wanted and edit things. And I didn't have to write a single line of code to get that website. The thing is that today, the same thing is happening as you know, at the beginning of uh, the 2000s. We started to get, not beginning, I'd say, yeah, mid-2000s. Uh, we, we got WordPress uh, that made it a whole lot easier to create websites. And now it's getting even easier. Uh, with things like Squarespace, and there's another one which is called The Grid, I think. Uh, but anyways, you know, these things, there's not this bottleneck anymore where, you know, in the beginning everyone wanted to have their websites, but uh, there weren't that many people who could program in HTML, CSS, JavaScript. So, you know, it was difficult to find someone who could, uh, who could create that website for you. And then, you know, it, it got uh, a whole lot easier to create websites, uh, and then the bottleneck was removed. So I think that the same thing is happening with machine learning. Now we have services, we have APIs that allow you to create these models very easily. You don't, you don't have to have the, the expertise in the algorithms and so on. Uh, you just have to have data, and you, you're going to be able to build your model from there. So two phases in machine learning, training and predicting. And there's two methods 
like functions and these prediction, prediction or predictive APIs. Uh, usually, uh, you've got one to train a model, another one to predict a model, and that sort of looks like that. That's the most technical slide I've got, I think. Uh, so you've got this create model function that takes in the data set, and you've got this create prediction uh, function that takes in the model ID that you got from the previous line, and it takes in the new input, and it's going to get you an output. And it's as simple as that. So you just need to provide that data. The data has to be good. Obviously, that's what we talked about. Um, and yeah, that data can just be a CSV file. So yeah, training.csv, for instance. Yeah, democratizing machine learning. All right. I'll do this. All right, so today we have two companies who have APIs uh, that allow you to do this. I really encourage you to uh, go talk to them uh, if you want to find out more about their, their, their APIs. Uh, they're very easy to use. And two companies are BiggerMail and Predixis. All right, so what if you have this problem? Is this email important? Yes, no. Actually, I've, I've used, I've used uh, it was a couple of years ago, no, it was a year ago. I've used the big ML API to, uh, with my own email data to build a, a model that would predict the importance of emails, and it worked quite well. That's, uh, that's in my book, actually, if you want to check it out. <laughs> and uh, there's other types of problems, like, so I mentioned churn prediction. Is this customer going to leave us next month? For that type of problem, you could still use you know, BigML or Predixis, but you could also use dedicated services, like this one uh, from ChurnSpotter. Uh, there's going to be a showcase this afternoon. Uh, this service is it's still going to take your own data, the data from your company, to learn how your customers behave. And then it's going to build a custom model, but it's, it's only going to work for Churn. So you know, you've got these services also that are uh, tar targeting one specific problem. For questions like this, you know, what is the sentiment of this tweet? So the answer could be positive, neutral, or negative. You don't actually need to build your own model from your own data of you know, tweets and associated sentiment, because this, the problem is the same for everyone, right? Sentiment analysis for me is the same as it is for you, almost, I guess. Before, you know, uh, email. Uh, detecting the importance of emails, you know, what I think is important is not the same as you because you know we don't talk to the same people, we don't have the same interests, and so on. So I, I'd need to have my own model of uh, email importance. But for you know predicting the sentiment of a tweet, uh, you don't actually need to train your model. You can just reuse a model that someone else has created. So instead of having two faces, well, in this case, you know, you don't have to train a model. You just predict with uh, a model that someone already created. And there's uh, services that allow to do, you to do that. So it's just a matter of you know, sending a bit of text, and it gives you the sentiment. So that's super easy to use. And for spam detection, you know, we all have um, the same notion of spam, more or less. So again, that's the type of problem, detecting spam, where you could reuse a model that someone else has built. All right, so I've mentioned a few use cases. I've said that there could be some limitations. Now, is there a way to say whether something is going to work or not? You know, there's limitations. We're taking them into account, but still, you know, it might be that we can't learn a model that does anything useful. So how do we measure that it works, and, and how do we quantify um, that? So yeah, I think I'm going to go very briefly over that. This is the real estate data. I've uh, rearranged things to, ooh, wait a sec. Yeah, so I've, I've put all the training data um, on top and all the, uh, the data for which we don't have the price values below. So I'll just keep the training data, right? I want to build my model from there. But actually, before building a model from this data, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to shuffle things to make sure that there's no particular order. Like, you know, it could be that all the, the townhouses are at the top, and then you know, all the, the condos or, uh, or houses there at the bottom. So I shuffle things to make sure that there's no particular order. And then I split things in two. Once I've done that, I copy the, uh, so for the second table, I copy the price values, and I remove them. But yeah, I've, I've, I've stored them somewhere else. Uh, what I'm going to do, actually, is I'm going to turn this into a prediction problem where I want to fill in the missing values here from 
the data that I've got above. So, you know, I reduced my training set in order to be able to evaluate it. And so let's say that I build this, I build a model from the data that, that's above, and then I predict the missing values. And then what I can do is that I can compare these predictions with the actual values that are removed, but still, you know, I, I put them aside. So I can, there's all sorts of ways that we can compare this. We can, uh, ooh, actually, there's a little bit of, uh, it's cropped a little bit, but still, you, you get the idea. Um, you can combine these comparisons to sort of get one measure. You could see the differences, the absolute values uh, of the differences, and combine that to get an estimate of how well your model is doing. And a perfect model would have zero error. And uh, yeah, that's a way, that's the main way that you can evaluate the, the quality of the predictions that you're doing. A lot of people talk of uh, real time, you know, doing real time, whatever. And that also applies to machine learning. So, you know, everything, every, everyone's wondering, you know, is it, is it real time machine learning? Um, is it going to be quick? Yeah, there's two things that actually in this question, there's two questions, you know. As I said, there's two phases in machine learning, training model and predicting with the model. So there's two things that you should have a look at in terms of, you know, being able to do real time stuff, which is can I do real time training or can I do real time prediction? Um, so yeah, if, if you hear that, you know, someone's telling you that it's real time machine learning, you might want to get more details. And the thing that I want to say here is that time is also a measure of performance. You know, how, much, how long does it take to, to train your model and to make predictions? And then, so you can measure these two things, and then in the end, you can also measure the accuracy of the predictions in the way that I showed before. Uh, so yeah, churn analysis, anyways, you'll hear more about that in the churn spotter um, showcase. But I think that churn is a really good example to sort of show you what the problems are with uh, you know, using machine learning in the real world, and that it's not about creating the, the, the model, it's more about using the model. So let's say that we are a SaaS company. We're selling monthly subscription to our service. And then we're asking this question, you know, is uh, the customer going to leave? The input is the customer. The output is the fact that, you know, the, the customer leaves or not. So you can observe that in your historical data. You know, like, who uh, did not renew his subscription uh, last month. So you can get the, the outputs this way. So you need to wait a month. Uh, you, yeah, like I said, you collect historical data up until a month ago. <clears throat> and so you want to be able to predict this output, but you know, you could you could do that without machine learning. Like you could just say, you know, if the, the customer or if the user has not, not used the, the product or the application for more than 15 days, then there's something wrong and probably the guy is going to uh, not renew his subscription. So that's a very simple rule that allows you to make these predictions. Maybe they're not good quality, but that serves as a baseline that takes into account some specificities of the domain. Like, you know, you sort of know that you, you enc you're encoding knowledge about the fact that, you know, you think that people, if they haven't used your application for 15 days, then uh, maybe they, they're already gone. So that serves as a baseline. Okay. Um, learning, you know, with these services, uh, it's, uh, with these predictive APIs, it's, it's super easy. But there's the question of how do I represent customers? So how do I... Uh, you know, create the, the right inputs in my CSV file that I'm going to send to the API. And then once I've, once I've predicted uh, churn, you know, what do I do about it? I know that someone is going to not renew their subscription, uh, and then so what? So there's two very important questions. Customer representation, I'll go very briefly over that. You know, you can take into account basic information about the person, how they used your service, uh, you know, the number of times they used the app during uh, last month, uh, the features they use, that sort of stuff, and you could also take into account any interactions they had with customer support. That allows you to characterize your user, your customer, and the way they're using your app, and this has an influence, obviously, on the fact that they churn or not. Then what kind of action can you take to prevent that churn, because you, you, know, you want to keep that, these customers. You can contact them, but then, you know, in which order? Uh, you can switch them to, once you've contacted them, you know, you still have to tell them something, right? So you could switch them to a different plan that's more appropriate to what they, they want to do. You can give them a special offer and they're going to be happy for some time, but, you know, is it going to work in the long term? Uh, or you could just do no action because, you know, you, 
so that's actually one thing that you, another prediction problem that you could have is, you know, trying to predict if someone is uh, churning because of reasons that are in your control or not. You know, sometimes people churn because, you know, they, they don't have any money anymore, or maybe you're selling something for, uh, you know, that only works on PC computers, and then the guy uh, buys a Mac, so you know, there's things that you can't, you can't do anything about, and turns out that in many cases you can predict that you know they, there's nothing to be done. You know that's very useful to take into account, and we'll we'll chat a little bit about that during our uh, conversation with uh, Claude Rivant from Orange. So we'll get some uh, insights from you know what, what they're doing in terms of uh, churn prediction, and you know doing things after detecting churn, uh, measuring accuracy. Yeah, I'm not going to go too much with that. Basically, you want to you know, make sure that you that when you predict a churn, that the person does churn, and when you predict that they don't churn, that they don't churn. That the customer churns, but you know he wasn't about to churn. Uh, then you know you've you've spent time and money maybe to retain that customer that was going to stay anyway. So you know you're wasting money. Uh, and if you if there's people who are going to churn and you can't detect them, then you know it's a missed opportunity. And then once you've got these measures of accuracy, you can compare to the baseline. That's what the baseline is useful for, for you know giving a uh, comparisons. And then you know you can estimate return on investment. Like I said, you know there's a cost in taking action for all these guys that you think are going to churn, and what you would earn. By doing that is you know the number of true positives, so the people who you've detected that would churn and would actually churn, you know you multiply that by the success rate of your actions, and you can multiply that by the revenue per customer per month to sort of have an idea of you know how much uh, revenue you you you're saving. Okay, and then you compare it to the baseline again. All right, very quick word about the machine learning canvas. I promised I'd say something about it. So yeah, here's the business model canvas, which is uh, which I got inspiration from. It's not a replacement of the business model canvas, but there's still things in common. Like in the business model canvas, there's this value proposition block where you you're saying you know what you want to provide, what which value you want to provide, and I've got that in my canvas as well. Um, but yeah, it's just a document to sort of you know lay out key things about, in this case, a business model. And in my case, so you can't really see that, but I'll, I've got a, uh, another diagram uh, where you can list the key aspects of your predictive system that uses machine learning. Um, what do I want to say? So yeah, it's not as pretty as the machine learning canvas. I still need to add icons and so on. So it's a work in progress, but still I think that you know, it's going to be quite interesting. So there's actually two, uh, two three rows First one is for you know giving background information. Second one is for specifying the what I call the engine, what some people call the engine, which is the thing that makes the prediction, the predictive engine that uses machine learning. And then the last one is you know about integrating the engine into your business or into whatever you're doing. It might not be a business, it might be just an app. Okay, and then there's uh, three columns which the first one is uh, related to the predictions that you, you, you're doing. The second one is where you give information about your objectives. And the last one is everything related to data. So this is sort of the uh, simplified view of the canvas. The first thing to do is to, I'd say, you know, start with a value proposition for uh, an end user. So you know you want to say like, let's say that you want to predict churn. So the the value proposition is that you know I'm going to make it easier for the guys uh, in customer relationship management to figure out you know who they should uh, who they should talk to if they want to if they want to retain a maximum number of, uh, of customers. It could be you know the value proposition is you know I have this uh, predictive uh, feature for you know emails like priority detection. And the idea is that you know the the user is going to spend less time on email because he sees immediately what's important and what's not. So yeah, you have to s explain what the va value proposition is and who the user who's, who benefits 
from the uh, predictions. And then, you know, if you want to build a predictive system, you need data. You need to use machine learning on some data. So what, what sources of data do you have? So that could be, you know, uh, data about transactions, uh, that, you know, this customer bought that. It can be external data uh, about, you know, um, I don't know, just any, any kind of source, uh, either internal or third party about, I mean, things that you could reuse in order to create a, a data set to learn from. And then you need to sort of, you know, go m into more details. So that's the specifications part, uh, where you would explain what the machine learning problem is so on the left side, yeah. So you'd say, this is the input, this is the output, and the prediction that, uh, that I want to make is, you know, I want to predict this output based on this input, and it's a uh, classification problem or a regression problem, and yeah, you can list out all the possible outputs and so on. And then you can move on to performance evaluation, where you're going to say well, which metrics are interesting for measuring the accuracy of your predictions, but also that relates to the value proposition. You know, how can you measure that you're delivering that value? So you have to have performance evaluation measures that are also domain specific, that take into account the specificities of uh, what you're trying to do. You know, that's, that are related to your business and not just numbers that. That, you know, that characterize the accuracy of predictions. In the end, you want to create that value, right? And then data preparation. So that's everything that has to do with you know, uh, getting your sources and turning them into the input representations that I talked about. So you know, which features, which characterizations of the inputs are you interested in? And in the end, you know, what, how many instances do you have in your data set? Do you use everything for training or, or not? So you know, you'd, you'd list out everything that relates to preparing that, that CSV file that you're sending to the API. And then integrations, actually, there's, there's only two blocks, because they kind of overlap the objectives thing. You're using, you, so you have to say how you're using predictions. Like you know, for churn, for instance, you're going to uh, see who might churn. And then you're also going to use the uncertainty in these predictions. So you, usually, you get uh, a prediction. And also, these APIs, they also give you a a, a confidence level. So you can use that to sort of, you can use that and the, the revenue that you would expect from that sort of customer in order to prioritize, you know, who you have to target first. Like, you know, someone who brings a lot of revenue and we're sure that they're going to uh, leave, then we have to do something about them right, right now. And yeah, the, you, you're going to explain here how you're using predictions in order to get that value. So you see it connects to the objectives. You know, in the end, you want to uh, reach the initial objective. And then learning model. So learning the model, you know, you're going to give some um, constraints on you know, how long do I have to, uh, to learn the model. And um, yeah, that relates, obviously, to the data bit. But also, you, know, you need to evaluate based on the objectives, based on the performance evaluation measures that your model is good before you actually you know, use it. So you know you might have a, a model that you use, and then you get new data, and you think that you can update the model, but then you ha you have to make sure that the um, the new model performs at least better than the uh, the previous one before you deploy things. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. And yeah, I guess that's it for the machine learning canvas. Um, so yeah, a couple of reasons to use it. It allows you to make sure that by connecting to the value proposition allows you to make sure that you're targeting the right problem for your company. Uh, by listing all these uh, key aspects and you know, constraints on uh, using predictions and learning models, you are able to uh, choose the right tools, solutions to build your, uh, to, to do this machine learning. And it also sort of allows you to see what is going to be more difficult. You know, is it, do we already have the data and nothing to Add to the data, or do we have to? Is there a lot of work to be done on the data? And then once we have predictions, it's very straightforward to use them. You can sort of see, you know, what what's going to take most effort. And then in the end, you know, it's a document that can be used by both business guys, technical guys, engineers, uh, data scientists. So you know, you can improve team communication if everyone's on the same page, right? If you want to learn more, just go to machinelearningcanvas.com. Uh, you can't download it yet. I've got a private beta version, but if you sign up, you'll get, you'll get it. And that's it. So I'll just recap the key points. Um, 
Machine learning is a way to create value from data. Two phases, very important, train and predict. Uh, predictive APIs is what make it more accessible, what democratizes machine learning. And if you want things to work, you know, it's not enough to just use the APIs. You have to have very good data. And before you start you know, working on, on creating your data set and uh, figuring out how the APIs work and so on, you have to be clear about you know, what you want to do with these predictions. And in the end, you know, if, you, uh, if you're serious about using machine learning, you also want to be measuring that it does something useful. So I guess that you have to also figure out which measures of performance you have. And uh, it's sort of like test-driven development. You, know, you have to figure out how you're going to test things before you actually implement them. And then there's uh, other problems like you know, deploying uh, apps in production. Uh, maintaining them, improving them, and Florian from uh, Dalek is going to talk about that, and that's, uh, that's going to be very interesting, I think. Um, but I won't say much about these problems. All right, so if you want to learn more, that's my book, which is over there. And uh, actually, that's how I got to uh, meet Kieran Thompson on the internet. He tweeted something about you know, finding out that, oh, yeah, there you are. Yeah, he's all right. That was the first tweet where we you know, kind of exchanged about machine learning. Kieran has sort of the same vision of you know, making it very simple to, uh, for people to uh, get started with machine learning. So yeah, that's uh, found out about my book, and then uh, yeah, we, we started talking. And yeah, that's my website, and uh, that's it. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Thanks. Thank you.